weeks. So it's, it's something is very, uh, very, this part is really important to me. And I'm here with Michael F. Shine, who I have known for years through Michael Roderick, through Helena Escalante. But this is finally, years later, we're connecting. Thank you so much for joining me, Michael. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. As I told you before, I, I've been a fan and of your show. And also the two people you named are uh, two of the greatest people on earth. And I don't, I really don't say that about everyone. I, I really, really think those are two of the best people in the world. So it's very cool that, that those were our connection. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got to second you on that because um, I interviewed both of them on my podcast and uh, Michael Roderick joined me live as well. And we're literally as we're going live and speaking, which if you guys have any questions, please drop them wherever you are on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, and even if Michael and I are, are unable to address them live, we always will come back and answer those questions for you. So please don't be shy. I've given Michael full permission to use me as a guinea pig and to really <laughs> dive into all the things that I'm maybe doing wrong or ineffectively. So uh, let this really be fun. Um, all right. So uh, you know, th this topic that we gather today is around a brand that Michael created called uh, Microfame. And I fell in love with the name immediately. I, I got to admit, Helena and I just got into and that was our conversation for brunch for like three hours in New York um, because it makes so much sense. So, so, Michael, could you please tell us a bit about Microfame, what, what it means to you, why you created such a thing? Yeah, I mean, we we could talk about this for about four shows. Um, so I'm trying to think of, of where to start. I mean, I think the the general concept is that in the past, if you needed to make a splash for whatever reason, if you were in business or if you were in the arts or or whatever, it was really challenging to. There were only a few people who could really quote unquote make it because you had to become famous, right? So I mean. On one hand, if you had a business in town and you ran a copy shop or a print shop or a graphic designer, then you were in a pretty good, you know, um, situation because everything was geographical, right? You know, you walked down the street or drove down the street and went to the local, you know, copy shop. But if you were doing something more ambitious, you know, like like an idea based business, like some kind of big what they call thought leadership now, which is a term I don't love, but some sort of consulting or selling your ideas or something in the arts, you know, uh, you know, writing books or or or, or music or or whatever, something something like that. There weren't really many channels to become known, so you had to get famous. I mean, you had to get on on the news. You know, you had to get on um, network TV. You had to get you know, a little bit later on clear channels, radio stations, there were 40 songs in, in on every format. And that was it. They owned by one company. Mm -hmm. So that was challenging. And the internet really changed that. So um, in the age of the internet, while you can really get lost because there's so much stuff out there, at the same time, there are all these little niches. So there are people who are really famous to me. I'm more or less in the world of marketing. And there are names like Gary Vaynerchuk and Seth Godin and Ryan Holiday, who if I, and I have done this, if I ask my mother, if I ask my friend, Hallie, who's a scientist, a, a clinical scientist, they don't know who those people are, right? Or for example, I have a 10 year old daughter. And when I was 10 years old, you know, as most 10 year old boys were, I'm 43 years old, I was into certain kinds of movies. So I, I and everyone I knew knew who Harrison Ford was. Everybody knew who Harrison Ford, everyone knew who Robin Williams was. My daughter doesn't really know movie stars. You know, she really doesn't know the big movie stars, but she really, really wants to go to England to meet LD Shadow Lady, who is a Minecraft YouTuber, who in the world of Minecraft is a big star. Mm -hmm. And I don't think most people outside of that know who she is, but she has millions and millions of views. So the trick today for certain kinds of industries is that if you want to be successful, the good news is you don't have to become famous. The other news though, and it's either bad news or it's an opportunity, is that you need to find what that niche is. You need to find a very compelling point of view that attracts attention. Mm -hmm. And then you need to just blitz that niche in the way that it looks like you're everywhere at once. So, so that's, that's micro fame. 
Yeah, I love what you're touching upon the things that I am doing and focusing on, not necessarily to say I'm an expert in, for example, when you say being everywhere all at once, live streaming services these days, multi-streaming or simulcasting services give you that ability, which I found myself in that niche somehow starting in May this year, the right. moment, right? Like I went live everywhere with these interviews right from Zoom. We're just simply on Zoom. I'm not even ultra, you know, branding my background or anything. Uh, people are asking me, oh, Faye, what's this? Like, how, why are you live on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook everywhere? How can you teach me how to do that? Uh, can you help me build a business around that? Uh, so it really welcomed a lot of new conversations. Um, and you mentioned YouTube as well. I started my YouTube channel last September, and now it has become a significant revenue stream for me. I had never imagined, which is a combination of uh, YouTube ads, um, partnership sponsorships and ads consists of nearly 40% of my monthly revenue. Uh, yeah, I, that's amazing. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. So dive in, let's dive in deep. <laughs> So, uh, so Michael, actually, the what's super exciting about this idea is that I think you, in a way, that you're able to break this down and, and help people realize that they don't have to be even that famous. Or Seth Godin, who's like 200 pound book, the red book over there, right. is talking about also the um, the minimal viable audience uh, as as opposed to MVP, the minimal uh, minimal viable product. And people get a little bit confused in terms of what, what that means is, um, is that not everybody will like your product, your services, or even you as a person. And that's okay because you don't need that many people to be successful. So Michael, I'd love to hear your take on that and how, you know, how you kind of process that. I think he's right. And, and Seth Godin obviously was a pioneer in that idea. In, in general, this idea, I've seen him on stage many times talking about how you really just need enough people to be into your stuff today. And he spoke about that very early. I think I want to add a caveat, which a lot of people miss, or an addition, I should say. So you talked a lot about, and this is where I might sound like I'm pushing back a little, I'm using you as a guinea pig, but you've done a very good yeah. job at this, but I think you've missed something that you do. Mm -hmm. um, on one hand, you got to pick the right platforms, right? But, but so, okay, am I going to do live streaming? Am I going to do YouTube? Am I going to do this? But those are all just the tools in your quiver. You've used them very well, but I can't tell you how many people I hear who say, they, they buy into this idea. They say, yeah, I need a minimum viable audience. I'm going to become an influencer, a YouTube guru, whatever. And they just sort of like create a lot of content and they work really hard and they can't figure out why they're not making a splash. And I think the missing piece is that just picking the right platforms and just getting your ideas out there simply isn't enough. You know, there's an element of human psychology and sociology. So the first thing is the bad part about the internet is that anyone can make stuff now. So you're competing with the world. So if you have a niche, first of all, you have to say to yourself, okay, what is it that I can say where I'm adding to the conversation that's already happening, but that's contrarian enough that stands aside? And then I call this hype, you know? It's what are those ways that I can, I don't want to say take advantage because it doesn't have to be deceptive, but how can I really play with the way people really digest information and are attractive to things. So I'll give you an example. So everyone's talking today about, there's this woman, Candace Owens, who is a um, ultra conservative, uh, like media personality, blogger, whatever. And she, so Harry Styles, who is in One Direction, the boy band, just appeared in some magazine in a dress. And he was talking about how he, you know, uh, I don't know, what was there, play with clothing, blah, blah, blah. And she posts a thing that says, I need, we need more manly ma men, you know, wearing a dress, blah, 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 is terrible. And then this guy, Ben Shapiro, who also is a media guru in the conservative space, a niche, uh, you know, um, posted, oh, there are, is a difference between men and women, you know, and wearing foo-foo dresses. Isn't it? Now, I and everyone else who, 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 
are not as conservative get worked up into a frenzy. Oh, you know, are you transphobic? And, uh, you know, you, you this and that. And then you take a deep breath and you think about it. These people are so smart. Do you think they really care that men are wearing dresses? I mean, men have been wearing dresses. First of all, Candace Owens wears pants, which used to be considered masculine. Second of all, Kurt Cobain and David Bowie wore dresses. It's ridiculous. This is a 50-year-old argument. But they know that it's a contrarian point of view. They know that if they say that, exactly what happened is going to happen because people love to form tribes. People love to take a side. And I found myself falling for it. Oh, you know, David Bowie wore a dress. So what are you talking about? And then I think to myself, that's exactly what they want. So the, the point is, there are people who just get their ideas out there. But there are people on every side of the spectrum of every point of view who are just so savvy in, in hyping themselves up. And you need that. You just do. I mean, that it doesn't work without that. Mm -hmm. And it's such an interesting example that you pointed out. And I see people do this a lot on LinkedIn these days out of old places. And to basically throw an argument out at, you know, very, especially very controversial uh, right. topics. People love like making you pick a side, making every argument very black and white. And, you know, sometimes to be honest, like I'll use myself as an example. I really struggle with that because I, you know, it's, I always trying to, we spend the first, I don't know, the first 20 years of our lives trying to blend in. And there is some right. lingering effect to say, I don't want to stand out. I want to be neutral. That's a great and, point. <laughs> right. And then all yeah. of a sudden we realize it, it, in order to go viral for good or for bad, you have to be kind of controversial. You have to have enough people to agree with you, enough people to disagree with you. And I remember Seth Godin said, um, a book will rise up to the you know New York Times, uh, whatever, never one seller, which he doesn't agree with in general, but it's about having uh, the people who buy books buy the book and people who never buy the book uh, will also buy the book. That's how That's you true. become that number one. So interesting. Before you said that, I actually haven't thought about it in a, a long time. And I think it's funny because a lot of times I think what, what sets apart the people who are really good at becoming micro famous and even famous in general versus the ones who struggle is that the ones who struggle, they think too much about the way the world ought to be. Like a lot of people say, well, if, you know, yeah, you know, um, being, you know, picking fights and getting people to take sides, you know, that might be success useful, but it's not how I want to operate in the world, blah, blah, blah. And, and then the other people say to themselves, well, this is just how humans are. And I have to think of a way to do it ethically. So to, to tell you how much that's the case, they've done studies. There was an archaeologist who, who found this little niche on the, like somewhere in, in South, not a niche, like an alcove in South Africa, where they're pretty sure that there was this mass extinction event and Homo sapiens almost died out. And there were these few little tribes that went to this area and found shellfish. And so they didn't have to hunt and they didn't have to look for food in the areas where everything had dried out. It was a climate change event. However, because the food was so easy to get, the only thing that was stopping them was other tribes. So over time, the members of our species that survived were the ones that formed very tight bonds and cooperated with their own tribe and had a lot of antagonism toward the other tribes. And, and now we've, as humanity spread back out across the globe, we all have that. So it doesn't have to be that you're a jerk and you you insult people or troll people, but everybody has this tribal mentality. I'm a Democrat. I'm a Republican. I'm a Mar you know I'm I'm a capitalist. I'm a this. I'm a that. You know, it's it's we all have these strong beliefs, and the only thing that's ever going to unite humanity is when aliens attack. You know what I mean? We're just very. It, it's just that 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 antagonistic state. We all we all do it. Even the, even the most kind of happy go lucky people. I mean, so. That's just what it is. I mean, that's what some of, you know, Game of Thrones is like a lot of these worldwide number one TV series phenomenon are, are really based on. Yeah, and true. It's, right? The White Walkers. Yeah, it's totally. From the show. Yeah, but right. But, but beyond the White Walkers, you're right. All of that game playing and, and just being like honest about human nature, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so uh, the one area I think I kind of totally distracted you for a second, but you're getting into something really juicy there, which is we talk a lot about passive income, scalable income, but nothing is quite passive. And I too know a lot of people, yeah. even people trying to 
sign up to uh, work with me, especially during COVID, are people who ask me, Faye, I see that you, you've had some initial success on YouTube. Um, that's exactly what I want to do. And I want to create content and I love, love content creators. And, uh, and they say how, you know, I need to begin monetizing right away so I can pay for your service and all that, but it's completely backward. And we all know that because, you know, there's so much work and effort and, and quote unquote risks and, um, exploration that happens before you can even see the first penny. I mean, literally the first penny, not even like $2. That's very true. Usually you're losing money in the beginning or at least burning through your savings. Yeah, exactly. How, and yet for me, I will say that I am so addicted to content creation. It gives me so much joy uh, to be able to connect even with just one person. Like if you guys are watching this, you're the one person that makes me happy and I cannot stop myself from, you know, to say, ah, it's not worth it. Uh, I need a minimal viable audience. I just have to do this. I think as a result, somehow that propelled me forward to say, all right, that's fine. I'm happy to collect my cash years later. Um, but how do you, Michael, how do you coach your clients, work with your people to say, look, dude, this is a really terrible idea versus, well, you're onto something. Like how do people know that they're making progress? That's a very common question. Yeah, I, I think there's two different questions there, but I think they're connected. I mean, I think that what, what I always try to tell people, especially if they're thinking about working with our agency and we're called, you know, micro fame media. So it's, it's, there are a lot of types of marketing that we don't do, you know, I mean, we are specifically involved at finding a niche, coming up with that point of view, and then figuring out which activities turn them into the authority in their niche. And the reason I bring that up is because if someone comes to me with an idea for content, not so much the product, but content that they're just sure is the right answer, I just don't know. Or even worse, if they say, I really want to hit it big on Instagram and get a lot of followers, I'll say to them, you know, you're telling me that you, you're really into hammers and you're really into screwdrivers, but you don't think nails are that great. How do you know? Those are tools. That's like saying I'm really into TV. So when you say I love creating content, that's true. I love writing, you know? Mm -hmm. However, writing what? Romance novels, business articles, poems? I mean, epic poems, ver lyrical verse, computer code. I mean, like, so, so these are tools. So it, it comes down to experimentation. First of all, it comes down to knowing how human beings work. There are just principles of how humans interact in groups. And you need to understand that so you're not doing things totally randomly. Mm -hmm. But after that, you have to conduct experiments. M minimum viable, I don't know, minimum viable uh, bet, you know, go out into the world instead of saying, I'm gonna invest $100,000 in Facebook ads and I just know it's gonna work. Why don't you instead create three Facebook ads and spend $100 and focus more on what's that idea that might work and make all three of them totally different. So, so let, let the solutions tell you what's good. I mean, I don't know. I mean, what, what do I know? I'm just a guy. Yeah. Well, what makes it that that's interesting. What makes someone appear someone or a company or individual to be a good client for you? How do we evaluate them to say, you know what, if you've done enough work, enough experimentation for, for us, to really collaborate and work together. Yeah, I, I think the experimentation is what we're good at. I think first of all, I'll run into a lot of clients who have been successful in one area and they think they have another idea. So they'll be successful and have made money in this very brass tax area. And then they have this really big idea and they want me to make it get attention no matter what. And when I tell them, yeah, I mean, this has some good stuff in it, but we have to test not only to see if we can bring attention to this idea, but if your idea is good, because if the marketplace hasn't validated it yet, just because you had one business, that's a good idea. It doesn't mean another business is. And a lot of time people come to us with their new ideas, because a lot of times they've already figured out how to make this stuff that they, the stuff they're bored with work, you know? Yeah. And if they're close minded about that, that they're so convinced their idea is a gift of genius, that's really tough for us to work with. That, that's one thing. Um, I think also, yeah, I, I mean, the basics too, just like there, there are certain clients who are, are a little bit entitled, you know, um, who, who feel that just because they've paid a marketing agency, 
means that no matter what they do, it should work. And if it doesn't, it's on us. So setting up interviews with them, to use a blatant example, and their job is so important and they're so busy that they reschedule 14 times, you know, four times with important podcasters. And then we can't make it happen for them. And they get angry at us that we didn't get enough exposure. So, so it's a partnership. Anyone who's open to adjusting their ideas, if someone already has a great product or a great service, especially a great service, and it's delivered results and they're making a decent living at it, but they know that it could conquer the world if it was, if it was marketed the right way, that's my favorite kind of client. Because that kind of person has already demonstrated that they have follow through. They've already demonstrated that their that their service or product has legs and they just need, you know, a marketing expert to make it happen on a bigger scale. That's my favorite kind of client. Mm. I, I hope I can reflect as you're talking. I want to just maybe reflect on some of my favorite clients as well. Um, I feel like we're talking about something very similar that whenever there's a client comes to me, as I said earlier, Faye, you're, you look good on YouTube. Okay. Let's make that happen for me. Three months monetize. And I said, sorry, I'm not going to lie to you. I won't take your money for three months and tell you it yeah, hasn't worked right, out. Right, My right. contract is protecting me from giving you guaranteed results. I can right. tell you right now I can, there's a very slight chance of that happening. And, um, what I did notice, believe it or not, running podcasts for six years, I didn't realize there are people from all walks of life who have listened to it. And some of them listen to, I wouldn't say every episode, but they're subscribers and they really try to catch up whenever they can. And when they hire me, my contract goes out, they sign and return it within a couple of hours, no questions asked. And they tell me, I want to invest in working with you for the next two to three years. Um, yeah, that, that's a fantastic, that level of, of, of trust and kind of putting themselves in the hands of the process, I think is a wonderful thing. Hands of- At the same yeah, time, so you, at the same time, you can't, this is me. Mm -hmm. If someone pushes back and they have some mistrust, I'm okay with that. And I'll tell you why, because there are a lot, marketing is a squishy thing. It's not like you're selling sheet metal or ball bearings, right? I mean, sheet metal gets to your factory or it doesn't. And it's pretty easy to figure out, you know? But marketing, I mean, especially digital marketing, it's really easy to smoke and mirror the thing. I mean, what is a good result? And it doesn't mean you have a lot of Facebook followers. I mean, I, I you know, I, I worked with, uh, with a contractor once who promised me a bunch of Twitter followers and got them for me. And when I dug into what they were, it was like, I, I don't even think these were real people, you know, to use an obvious example. So like, yeah. It, it's very easy or, or someone, a PR person who gets you in a, in 10 magazines, but you don't make a penny mm -hmm. as a result. Right. So people are a little gun shy and I get that, but if they don't do their part, if, if, if you set a date in the sales process, if you set a date to have a decision and they ghost you and then call you back four weeks later and then don't, you know, I mean, you, you can, it, it is a partnership when, when you become someone's agency you're exchanging money for something equally as valuable you're not their servant mm -hmm, to, to exactly be, right so that that's a bad sign too i love the two points on michael's you know i, I want to summarize and, and really kind of dive in deep too number one whenever i work with a virtual assistant my editor i have three people on the face world team which is really quite small and i have contractors who are not hired on a full-time basis now what i learned i did something I thought I was so unusual because people told me, what, you you ask your virtual assistant to think with you? You're asking her to be in a right. strategic partner? And I love I've had, that. Yeah, and, and, and I said this, yes, you know, that's that's what I did. Number one, I'm thinking I can't afford to, you know, have, you know, I can't hire people for $10,000. Oh, so no, you've granted yourself permission to think with me. Um, I, I, I leverage them as human beings and I cannot tell you how helpful they've been. And, and some of them much younger than I am. Actually, all of them are younger than, than I am. And they're giving me insights that I never thought it was possible. So that's one thing, Michael, as you, you pointed out, like trust that people, trust those people. And number two, very recently, 
one of my clients and I are so excited uh, to start a new email sequence. For those of you guys who don't know what that is, or you don't have an email list, it's basically a sequence of emails that you pre-construct, right? And some of them are kind of in some sort of logical sequential order, and you're, you're trying to teach them one or two things. And the original effort, Michael, the, the way I did this was we're trying to grow the list a little bit. We know wasn't wasn't going to grow tremendously because he's he's a senior executive. So we saw we thought let's attract more of the right people. Now, what the secret agenda and I we kind of vocalized to each other is that we really want to nurture the 200 people he does have. Right. Uh, right. Those are the people who have worked with him, super warm leads. And as soon as we finished the sequence, only five emails over the course of eight days, one of his clients came back and signed up with him. We're talking about significant project offer. That's a, that's a big deal. And that's very smart because you basically, it, it's funny. I see that all the time. I'll, I'll ask people, pick prospects or whatever. And I'll say, how, yeah, I want to get a million Twitter followers. Okay. How, how much is one sale worth $50,000? And I'm just like, do you think that of a million Twitter followers, like that's your, that's your audience for people willing to spend $50,000. Right. I would rather have a thousand CEOs. Mm -hmm. It's important to think of these things. And it sounds like, I mean, this is what you do for a living and you're very good at it, but this, this is, that's a smart approach. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just, I was so excited. And by the way, the, the celebration with a client, because I got to admit, I love the people I work with, you know, and I think love comes in many shapes and forms. And I, I think of them as, you know, family, as thinking partners and people I truly care about that a couple of my clients recently had you know, non life threatening surgeries and literally, oh. I, you know, nothing too serious, but it's still serious because it's operational. And um, so I remember just checking in with them and like, I actually felt like, oh, I, you know, truly feel better and let's get back to work and or relax as needed. So um, super powerful. So I'm going to pivot a little bit because I feel like I can talk to you forever. Like <laughs> we, we definitely will talk about the book in a second too. Okay. Um, just for my audience who are maybe watching this right now, uh, sure, I, I work with clients who are senior executives and, and all that who have become really successful entrepreneurs. But I don't know what's going on with COVID, um, COVID-19. I now see a lot of experts who we're backed or work for a, a giant organization, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, we're talking about huge agencies or, or hospitals and there are experts and then they're building new companies, but, you know, either leaving their jobs or like really trying to build something brand new during COVID, which is I'm sure it's very scary to them. But how do you recommend people maybe leverage their expertise and what do they have to pivot? Because I definitely see people struggle on many different levels to realize the skills they need in order to actually make a splash or make a living on their own. Yeah. I mean, before trying to pretend that I have all the answers, I, I, I don't, I have some ideas, but I also want to give some sympathy and empathy because this is really hard. I mean, this is, this is not like a regular recession. This is a weird thing that's going on. I mean, this is a once every hundred years, yeah. kind of thing. So yeah, I, I want to pay um, credence or whatever the word is to the idea that everyone is out there, especially in our world, in the entrepreneurial world, everyone kind of does the rah, rah thing, or else you wouldn't be able to get up every day with all the uncertainty. So they say, you know, turn lemons into lemonade. And, and um, it, you know, usually hard times or opportunity is in disguise. And that's all true. At the same time, this is really tough. I mean, you know, if, 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 if you know, if you were in the speaking business, yeah, you can do digital talks and there's a way to do it and you can create products. But it kind of sucks that you can't get paid 20 grand to show up and, and <laughs> do a talk. I mean, that, if that's years. what you're used to, you know, I mean, that's that's hard. Mm -hmm. If if you're in our world, in the marketing world, yeah, you know, the the, the the big campaigns are coming back. That being said, it's a lot harder to close a deal when people don't even know if they'll be in business in three weeks. And people are worried about the political situation. I mean, we've never had a situation where there might not be a, a, an orderly transfer of power. I mean, so, so, so that's uncertainty is not good for business. So the first thing I want to say is just, I don't know, it's tough. That said, um, you know, I do think 
so so I mean, I don't want this to sound like a plug for the book because I know we're going to talk about the oh. book, but it's but it's been on my mind a lot. So the book that I wrote is called the Hype Hand Book. And it's basically about looking at the techniques of really unconventional promoters, like like some some really fun people, some really bad people. So pro propaganda artists, uh, cult leaders, but rock managers, people in hip hop, um, you know, carnival barker kind of people. And the idea is to apply those things ethically because they have those kind of people have a really good understanding of group psychology now the other thing though is that i took the name the hype hand book from hip-hop because in um the word hype is usually considered a bad thing you're hyping something up that isn't you know that isn't um real but in hip-hop there's always a character called the hype man who's <laughs> part of the group, like Flava Flav, right? Yeah, and they get the crowd, you know, excited and they lead the street teams and they rap. And I think, I, I thought about that a lot. And why does that, why did that come out in the hip hop even in the early days? Because African-Americans are perpetually going through a pandemic. You know what I mean? I mean, they, 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 they don't have the same opportunities as other people. Some do, mm -hmm. but it, it's interesting, like, um, the book 48 laws of power written by robert green which is this re green which is this really machiavellian book it's like a modern machiavelli it's like very clear-eyed about what it takes to be powerful and people have really criticized it because it's it's too harsh but um it's really really popular in the african-american com uh, community in terms of percentages it has a lot of african-american buyers ra and rappers have rapped about it because if you're black in america you realize that it's a luxury to play by the rules, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people who, who are African-American who do happen to do well in our society say to themselves, I gotta use shortcuts, I gotta use workarounds, I gotta hack the system, you know? And so I think that's one thing. If, 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 if you wanna be realistic about what it takes to make it in this very crazy time, you might have to throw out the window all of your traditional ideas. Build sales funnels like this, this, and this. Write a book and get $15,000 speaking gigs. Do the sales process. You might have to take a page of the book of people who have lived on the margins, kind of get really clear-eyed about how the world, how it really is right now, instead of how you wish it had been, what it was, because we all wish it were different right now, and then figure out how to use that as raw clay to, 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 to make stuff happen, you know? Because I don't have a recipe. I think you got to look at the masters and figure out how people on the outskirts have always done it when things weren't going well. Yeah, look, look at that. I, I'd love to hear a bit more about the books too, because like you said, some of these people are not even good people, but they were able to get around um, the traditional system. And, you know, I, I see a lot of very successful people in businesses who don't play by the rules and they became very successful and they ended up helping people. Um, so. I would throw out one tip perhaps is to look at where the opportunities are and break the barriers of what you're familiar with. And I know that feels so uncomfortable. I mean, come on, if we change shampoos and lotions one day, was like, ah, you know, your skin gets all like very reactive. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for me to think about a lot of the content presented on YouTube, if I use doctors for, for instance, there are a lot of uh, psychotherapists and therapists and doctors who are really gaining momentum on YouTube like mm -hmm. I've never seen them before. Uh, and guess what? They used to be PowerPoint presentations, audience, terrible audio, you can't hear them, and they're talking directly to other doctors and people want to learn from them. Now I see a lot of these therapists talking directly to you, to the audience. Oh, you're struggling with this? And I'm sure you have difficulties accessing hospitals. These are the things that you can you can right. ask your primary doc, uh, care doctors. These are the things you can think about and giving them additional resources that are frankly very hard or inaccessible to people right now. So um, I, I think those are just like thinking outside the box. I don't necessarily love that term has really played it's well true. for a lot of people. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a guy that I know named Robbie Samuels. I was actually on uh, his podcast. I don't even think it's out yet, but I was just interviewed. It's called On the Schmooze. Yeah. And he had done really well sort of doing um, a very in-person oriented business, you know, mm -hmm. about presenting and things like that. And his business got murdered in this thing. So what he did, and he's done very well, he he basically, 
after probably laying in bed for a week or whatever he did, he got up and brushed himself up and he said, okay, there's all these people doing stuff on Zoom. I know a lot about interpersonal presentation skills. So in a very short period of time, he's sort of become the preeminent kind of expert teaching people how to use Zoom properly to, to get their point across and present and make money. And he's done well with it. So that's a good example yeah, of what you're right. saying. Yeah. Yeah. I I am familiar with his work uh, as okay. well, and I've been following his on the schmooze uh, Zoom hangout every Friday. Yeah, so there you go. Yeah, yeah so, you're, so you know it. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. I know it. It's like we, we, we have this close-knit network of people always doing experiments. Um, yeah, it takes, a, it takes some guts and not everything is, you know, has to work, but you just have to kind of go at it and um, no matter what age you are, I know that for some folks would be like, oh, I'm, I can't look like a fool to anybody. Well, let's just, come on, look at the situation. I mean, take a risk now or never, so. But, um, but the reason I gave that preamble also is because I think it's really important not to beat yourself up because we read these books and, and it, you know, you, you think, yeah, yeah, Robbie did it, I should be able to do it. And, and it's hard, he just happened, he's a smart guy, but also he just happened to hit the right thing, I think, if you fail a few times, you got to give yourself a little credit. These are really tough times. There's no playbook for what we're going through. True, true, exactly. Well, speaking of playbook, you, you didn't write a playbook, Michael, and that's coming out in January 2021. And there are links in this description below. Again, as a reminder, throw us any questions. We'll check in and, and respond to all of them uh, for you guys. But um, yeah, Michael, tell us about the book. Who will be a good audience? Like if we have creative entrepreneurs watching, fitness entrepreneurs, people who just left their jobs or struggling with their jobs, like what, what can they get from the book? Who do you want to target? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think anyone who doesn't have a direct path or, or a well-trod path for um, getting attention for their stuff, which, which is sort of everyone right now because the world is sort of falling apart and reassembling itself, you know? But like, I mean, if, if you have a small business, if you have a piece of art, you know, a book, if you have anything like that and, and you need to figure out how to sort of attract a lot of attention and move people emotionally to take an action, whether that's buying your thing or investing in it, it's for you. I mean, I, I think that and I, everyone in the world today, I mean, in the, in the old days, if you were working for Procter & Gamble or any kind of marketing organization, did you need hype? No, not really. I mean, you had your supply chain secured, you had your advertising budgets fixed, you had the ad agencies that already knew how to create great ads. I mean, there was no real reason to hack the process, which is why you learn a lot more about this stuff from the Sex Pistols manager or something like that than you would from Procter & Gamble. At the same time, Richard Branson was an upstart. He started a... Uh, record label and then went on to start an airline and he was an upstart in every new industry that he did and he used all of these practices and i define hype as any activity that you um any series of activities that get people emotional a number of people so that they'll take the action you want them to take and that can be a great action a bad action a neutral action but but that's how i define it and i i created this whole concept because um I, I went on my own. I mean, I, I uh, had a job and I learned a lot there, but I, after a while, I was really unsatisfied and I left and I became a, I was a writer before I was anything. And I wanted to be a, a marketing writer just because I knew that there was money in it. I mean, I had wanted to be a novelist at one time and, um, but I like writing and there's more money in marketing writing than, than a lot of other things. And I knew I was good at it. And, um, I got some jobs, but I could not systematically get people to buy from me. I just didn't know how to attract attention. And I read every traditional marketing book and it was like, so I learned a little, but like it was either hyper vague. Like I like Seth Godin's stuff, but it's really vague. Like he'll, he'll, he'll give you the idea of like, <laughs> ask permission before you, you know, market to someone. I'm like, yes, you just completely changed my framework, but I have absolutely no idea how to do that. <laughs> or, or, you know, or it would be hyper specific, like, yeah. Set up six landing pages with a sales funnel and a sequence of May, June, and July. And I'd be like, oh, say what? Like, what Like what about what? So I, I didn't really learn a lot. I learned a lot, but it, I didn't make an extra dollar. And so I, I went back to my past. I mean, I used to be an artsy kind of kid. And I, I really liked learning about, like, rock managers. I played in bands. And I was a little bit of a, 
a weirdo myself. So like we we used to, I played in a band in New York that um while we didn't make it, quote unquote, we, we had some success. You know, we sold out clubs and had a residency and we were even on TV at one point. And um, I don't, th- I'm a pretty mediocre singer. I mean, I was a really good punk screamer, but then we started writing real songs um, and, and, you know, whatever. So, but we would do things like I would put uh, posters up everywhere that said Dave Matthews must die because he was really popular at the time. And like, um, I would dress like a nun and make sure the press was there to see it, you know, because we had a song. So I was like, well, that was all marketing, but like, why didn't I think of it as marketing? Why am I reading about sales funnels? Like, what, what is this? So I said, what if I started to study these people? So um, being very desperate, I had a niche. I, I am not famous. I never have been famous, but I'm well known in a niche. I mean, you heard about me before we ever met. Mm-hmm. So the way that started was I had read this principle, which is one of 12 of how people, hype artists, as I call them, almost always create us versus them dynamics, as we talked about before. So I didn't like the advice Gary Vaynerchuk was giving. I think he's a great, great, great talent, but I also, but there was one part of what he was giving as advice to young people that I thought was really um, leading them the wrong way. So I wrote an article called why Gary Vaynerchuk is flat out wrong on Inc. And he responded that night and I was a nobody and he was really aggravated and all his fans were like all pissed off, you know, and the whole deal. But I started to gain all these followers and I started to get clients. So it's like, there's something to this. So there was the concept of microfame, which is sort of the meta thing. Like you don't have to get famous, you have to get microfamous. And I named my agency after that. But then it was a question of what, where do you learn what to do to get microfamous? I don't want to be just Seth Godin, who I think I would love to be Seth Godin, but I don't want to just be like, get microfamous. Oh, that's the answer. It's like, okay, get microfamous, but what do you do to get microfamous? So that was my quest of like, let's study the people who really know how to get famous, you know? And it yeah. worked. And I, and, but it was always important to me to apply it ethically. Like, I don't want to, I didn't leave a job to become a con artist. You know what I mean? It, right. it quite, quite the contrary. Mm. Yeah, exactly. There's a very fine line there. So there are many methods. There are, I think, 12, how many tips? 12 tips? That yeah, I mean, I, and 12 distilled from like, I, I read so many biographies, so many books on group psychology. And then I u- tried to use different things and see which worked and which didn't. Mm-hmm. And I, I felt you could, I found you could really bucket that wide array of things into 12 strategies. And, and it mm-hmm. seems to have been the case. Mm. So can we tease out maybe one of them? Like, uh, obviously it's not equivalent to reading the entire chapter, but what would be one tip uh, that could lead huh. people the, the, towards the right way? I'll give you a few because I already talked about us versus them. And I think that's about picking an idea. You don't have to bash a person you can pick an idea that you disagree with. So say to yourself, what's a point of view in my sphere, in my niche, in my industry, that every time I hear it, it's considered gospel. And I think it's really misguided. Mm -hmm. Do the opposite. You know, so I thought at the time, Gary Vaynerchuk was all about hustle culture. He used to say tweet from the toilet at three o'clock in the morning, you know, like, and that's how, and I thought that was really, really misguided. So I just said hustle culture is stupid, you know, and that got a lot of attention. So that's one. Um, another one, you know, that I mean, there are a lot that that would take a long time to go into. One is about being theatrical and you can be theatrical without dressing like a nun. You can do that in whatever industry you're in. Um, one is called Milk Before Meat, which is about introducing bold new ideas in little increments because we can digest that better. One is called Make It Scientific, where you can take simple ideas and wrap them. So this is a good one. So Simon Sinek, right? However you feel about him, if you watch him, most people would guess that he was some sort of researcher from a university. He's got his little spectacles and he uses words like dopamine and, and um, epinephrine or whatever, these very like uh, things. And then you find out he worked at an advertising agency. The guy hasn't, has done, he has been a professional marketing and sales guy from the day he graduated college, you know? Mm -hmm. So why does he do that? Why does he talk with dopamine, epinephrine and the neural pathways and the this and the that? It's because if he were to just say, you know, start with why, yeah, it's really important that you love what you do and that you have a reason for for picking your job. You'd be like, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, I mean, (laughs) you know, I mean, like, you know, but if he starts with the, the human, you know, corridors in the brain neural pathway, he says that meaning applied to work, Suddenly he's got a TED talk and this, 
So people ha- use mental shortcuts, right? Like if you if you see a doctor come in with like ripped jeans and like, you know, a dirty t-shirt or whatever, you're going to be like, get me a new doctor, right? And, and he might be the world's greatest doctor, but why do they wear, a, you know, I mean, a doctor will wear a stethoscope, even if they're not going to listen to your heart, you know, and they used to wear white coats. So, so like, that's because we use mental shortcuts in, in deciding who's credible. Yeah. And so if, if you have simple ideas and you want to set yourself apart, wrap it in all kinds of jargon. So if, if you're trying to set yourself apart, don't use jargon at all. Use simple language. If the idea is very, I mean, if the idea is new, I'm sorry, if the idea is really radical and really brand new, <laughs> use terms they already understand. So the reason Martin Luther King was very successful is because he 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 was introducing a very radical idea for America. And he always talked about from sea to shining sea and the Declaration of Independence, whereas defund the police is the worst slogan of all time, because it sounds you hear that and it sounds like we're going to dismantle the police and we hate America. And whether that's true or not, that's very scary to people. Right. So if you have an idea that's challenging, use very plain language and introduce it in small steps. If you have an idea that's really run of the mill, but you just happen to do it well, but you're in a crowded space, put all kinds of jargon around it, you know, neural pathways, epinephrine, you know, uh, whatever, you know, or or whatever's applicable. So that, that would be a couple of tactics. I love that. Thank you so much. Because I started uh, an experiment maybe just a few months ago that I, uh, to be honest, if you guys go to faceworld.com on the um, the front page, the, the hero um, image, and there's a call to action that says uh, how, you know, how I explain what I do in plain English. And frankly, I already had my services page in plain English. That's kind of my, you know, model the whole time. But still, I realized I came from business consulting and advertising. There are a lot of jargons that we are so married to that we don't even realize. It takes a a while to kind of offload them. And I thought, what if I can write something that an eight-year-old, literally an eight-year-old can read and explain to his or her auntie, uncles or whatever, and to other eight-year-olds, I've done something really interesting there. And to be quite honest, I also don't know a lot of big words myself. So it was a (laughs) <laughs> but well, hold on, you, you hit upon a good point because you, you have to have nuance with all of this stuff. So the reason you did that is because everyone else in your field is using this meaningless jargon. So if you hear words like thought leadership and brand and all these brand identity, you don't think to yourself, wow, that person's an expert. You think to yourself, that person didn't have the deep, they didn't think deeply enough. They didn't have enough understanding of what they do to go beyond the cliches. So that doesn't give you authority. So by being plain in your speech, you've set yourself apart from all of your competitors. Now, if you were at the same time, if you were selling something that was very run of the mill and that everyone else used plain language because it was just, just so basic by by using exalted language you will give it an air of authority that makes people think it's a cut above. It's why someone will sell, there's hand lotion, face lotion, whatever, that that sells for a thousand bucks, like that Jennifer Lopez uses. And what could lotion really do? But the, the mother of pearl extracted into a fine distillation process of it. I mean, it's, it's lotion, it's cream, right. you know? Yeah. So like, that's what I'm saying. It's a nuanced kind of thing. So you've done the right thing for your specific circumstance. Mm -hmm. But then if you have something really run of the mill, like cream, you know, lotion. Yeah. Then you need to kind of use words to puff it up a little bit. So if you guys, whoever's watching this, if you work for like, I don't know, L'Oreal or like, you know, make sure you come back and attack Michael a little bit and start the conversation. But we all know it's true. I mean, you know, I mean, some lotions are better than other lotions, but let's be honest, there's not a lotion on earth that's worth $1,000 in terms of pure value. Oh my God. So for for my, some of my friends, out there who so believe in what is it called la mer i don't even la mer, that's say. yeah that's one of the ones i'm thinking yeah five hundred dollars for a tiny little jar when i go back to it's ridi- that's the one i'm thinking of it's not a thousand it's five hundred it's ridiculous yeah exactly i don't even know how to but say god it bless them god bless them they were able to make that happen i mean I, you know like yeah 
tiny jar, okay? And we're not even talking about like your four ounce ones. Like they're 1.7 ounce one. It's like three, four or five hundred dollars. And I go back, doesn't matter what, especially to China. Um, it, it, you know, all my girlfriends from high school, you could be living in Shanghai, Macau, doesn't matter. Everybody has a jar. In fact, it, it's such a tribe. When I pull out my CVS products and they go, oh, so you do not have a jar of La Mer. Like you could use whatever, anything else, but you gotta have a jar of La Mer. It's like, sorry, I just, I can't afford it. I Ridiculous. don't have one. <laughs> Where are you from in China, by the way? This is off topic, but. Oh, Beijing. I was gonna ask you about your, man, we got, you gotta come back. We have to talk about China. I'm like obsessed with China now. I went there a year ago and I had such a good experience that I'm, I'm, I'm like really into Chinese culture. Like I really, I went in 2008 and it was like a tourist trip and I didn't get that much out of it. And I was invited by two Chinese people who I've become very good friends with. And I spent the whole time with them and I, I just fell in love with this, the country and the culture yeah oh my god it was so it's so lovely i grew up there until i was 17 a lot of people yeah. don't know that even though my friends can all more or less hear my accent or where i get it's very stuck. slight i hear it but it's extremely slight yeah yeah and then also like this it's the people say it's the package right there's certain it, whole accent and cultural things are very different because in addition to the slight accent people can see that i respond to things differently or what what I'm into or when they name a, a toy they used to play with in their childhood, they were like, wait a minute, you're the same age. How come you've never heard of this thing? Yeah. <laughs> right? It's like, oh, well, let us introduce you to it now. What, so, what's that candy you have that are like Tootsie Rolls? I brought them back. White Rabbit. Is that what it's called? White Rabbit. I, have I brought I brought back a thing of them for my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, it's so funny because we grew up <laughs> yeah. eating uh, White Rabbit is this milk candy that, you know, very, very traditional. We never had it. Yeah, we don't have it. Yeah. And now there's a green tea version, like a matcha version of it. Many different flavors, like strawberry version, but the milk one is the most traditional. And my American friends used to say, oh, it's so disgusting. Who eats like milk candy? And it's delicious. Like, it's actually it good. It's actually, it's actually good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I remember you learned um, Chinese waifu or... I, I don't oh, know oh, wei. Wu wei. Okay. Is, is that how you waifu pronounce it? Waifu is how people call me. Like instead of oh. fei wu, but waifu. Oh, wait. Um, oh they say, oh, because it's the sorry. name is backwards. <laughs> oh, yeah. Waifu. Right, right, right. Yeah, I forgot that the, the name or our names are backwards, but yeah. Right, <laughs> um, exactly. So you learned uh, Kung Fu as well? Oh, yeah. So that's a totally, um, so not because of, I mean, it probably had something to do with it. But when I came back, just for various reasons, I, I happened to a, uh, in, I met a teacher who is not Chinese, but I started, it's called Wing Chun, which I'm sure I'm not pronouncing correctly, but it's the It Man, you know, branch. And I'm really enjoying it a lot. Oh. Yeah, Wing Chun, I gotta. I think I may know the original. Oh, I need to find the original master. It was um, Moi Yat was one, and um, yeah, it man. Which I Chinese is a funny language, Mandarin, because I took Spanish all through school and I learned a little bit of it, but I'm not fluent, you know. Mm -hmm. And when I went to China, like people that I met there would like tell me to pronounce something, and I couldn't even remember it. Like after they told me, the tones are are so crazy. Yeah. So then I was in the elevator of the hotel and I met these two Spanish people from Madrid and I felt like they were talking English. I mean, it was so much. It's like I could understand them better than I would understand Spanish here because the languages are so much closer than like Chinese. I don't know if English is hard for Chinese speakers, but that is a really different language than. Oh, it's than very different. Oh, it's all the Latin uh, oh, Latin or yeah. which in general, you know, sort of uh, Roman languages are all very difficult for Chinese people. Um, my friends, I've never really learned Japanese, Korean seriously, but I've heard from my Chinese friends to say that they, they do feel a little bit easier, um, to yeah. us, the, the writing and pronunciation. Yeah. And, um, they just, it's just so fascinating. People always ask me, what do you, which language do you dream in? And, uh, it really depends if it's my parents, I'm talking to my parents, uh, probably Chinese, everything else is in English. And they always ask you like how your brain, if we're speaking of neural pathways and, and dopamine and dopamines and, yeah. you know, it's just very different for, for us. So. But I, I really, I really gain, and you just see all of the, like, every country has its faults, but like when you, when you go and you actually spend time with people, you just realize that like people are people, you know what I mean? That so that's the true. main thing. Yeah everything you hear and you, you learn exclusive from the news but you know, where you get your news from but just in general it's so different than making friends and even even if you you know you're in america you're not going to travel to asia anytime soon grab make a couple of friends go to chinatown sit there and actually yeah. 
just be immersed in in that environment even though chinatown doesn't really represent china frankly still just getting to know people having that conversation eating their food asking questions i love the food by the way oh uh, that's fu a, a funny thing happened oh uh, i don't know i like these like this like shredded potato stuff that they would always serve in in the meals i thought that was really good yeah my mom makes the best ones Absolutely. yeah those were yeah. Um, shredded really potatoes. good but um, it was funny because one thing I noticed about China, we probably have to run soon, but one thing I noticed about China is that um, they don't, as a rule, drink coffee first thing in the morning. Like they have it, but it's not like the thing people wake up to. And I'm like, I can't really function without it, you know? <laughs> so I would, I would be like at this place and they didn't have coffee. So we went on this team building thing and we went to this amusement park. It was in uh, Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. And we got there and the only place that had coffee was a KFC. So I went into the KFC <laughs> and I got a coffee and I come out and it was like 10 a.m. in the morning. And the guy we were with who didn't speak English that well, but who we got to be friends, he's like, oh, you want a hamburger? And I'm like, you just totally stereotyped me. I'm going to get a hamburger at 10 o'clock in the morning because I'm American, you know? <laughs> I just want a cup of coffee. You know, so like, hamburger, you want a hamburger? <laughs> <laughs> I know, seriously, it's, it's, yeah. just so, it's just so funny when I take my friends to go to get dim sum in, in Boston and even even they were talking about, uh, you know, like when the waiter comes over and be like, Faith, this is what American people like. Um, you should get these. I'm like, no, 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 they're not here for that. They're going to eat what I eat. So, right. Yeah, it's so wonderful. Yeah. I, I love this part because uh, I am running. I need to run to a, a meeting at noon. And my, I will let you go. Yeah, I, I, we'll definitely pick it up. My uh, meeting attendees are all actually watching this conversation. They're like, hi, meeting attendees. Hi, Anna. Thanks for watching. <laughs> I know you love this part about China. So um we gotta let, let's have a let's have a part two of this i feel I like love it i'll be come back anytime you want me i had a lot of fun with this awesome awesome michael so i'll keep you posted on you know we're gonna again everybody this is live but then it's gonna be part of the face world podcast as well on google spotify apple and um this is amazing michael i'm gonna take us offline and uh we'll yeah i'm gonna take us offline first bye guys don't miss us too much we'll be back